Um, the workshop this morning, um, th there were a couple of people that said that they're working for the Swedish government and all kind of government run projects to do kind of any kind of agile there or anything like that. And um, it's kind of um, a curious thing that I think Sweden is actually the first country ever to run kind of agile projects with high level of product ownership involvement ever in history. And um, there was this famous project where the, the product owners were very, very hands-on. There was one key product owner that was completely bought into the whole thing. And the team was trying to kind of deliver and they were pretty much delivering everything the product owners wanted. And the product owner was um, actually the budget holder as well. So it's not like the typical scrum product owner that doesn't really own anything. This was the guy that actually was financing the whole thing uh, because it was his budget. And the project is famous for producing something that is kind of the Swedish national symbol these days. This. <laughs> um, so um, the, the, I, I kind of, um, the reason why it's in, in a pristine condition like this and, and it looks so beautiful is that um, kind of it was preserved for us. <laughs> by the virtue of people who built it because um, as, as kind of the um, king of Sweden who was the key product owner for this was trying to change the specifications all the time and kind of couldn't decide whether he wants a longer ship or a shorter ship or kind of at, at, at the time at least you know, I wasn't there then, unfortunately, but uh, from what I've read, this was kind of a similar situation that we have now with Amazon Clouds, where um, people can't decide whether they want an on-premise deployed solution or de something deployed in the cloud. And at the point when they were building the Vasa ship, um, this was just when cannons were becoming viable to put on ships. That's kind of one of the um, weirder sides to the story that not a lot of people know. And uh, people couldn't decide whether they want a ship that was kind of built for cannons or whether the ship that was built for Boeing until very late on. And um, before then, most ships were built kind of to put lots of people on, the, on board ram it into another ship and they just jump over and kill everybody where because of the technology improvements it was now becoming possible to do cloud deployments where you know a ship can just come close and then shoot at another ship with cannons and they were changing the specs all the time and um, the, the end result of accommodating every possible wish of the product owner was basically that the ship shipped but it only shipped for about a kilometer and a half where it was preserved for everybody then to, to be able to observe in, in the beautiful Vasa Museum later. Which is, you know, an incredible business value now, but not what the original intent. So, <clears throat> and, and one of the key problems with um, this thing is the thing shipped. A lot of software teams that I've worked with over the last seven or eight years are very proud of shipping, but they ship in the same way as this. It goes for about a kilometer and a half and then falls over because somebody decided to put five more cannons on top just the day before the deployment. And in kind of a, a, a lot of what we do in software is kind of not really positioning us for success. And that's what I want to talk about today. And um, there's lots of stuff going on, going on in the community and people talking about build, measure, learn, talking about kind of user stories, iterative delivery and how we have solved these problems. And in my experience, um, the way people typically understand user stories and the way people typically understand iterative delivery falls short of solving this problem. And this is because we're not asking the right questions, we're not really looking for the right things. If we talk about build, measure, learn as one of the kind of more popular concepts these days, or if we talk about Scrum and um, kind of retrospectives and iterative improvement around the process and things like that, um, <clears throat> they're all good ideas based on whether we're measuring the right things. 
And this is where Doug Hubbard's fantastic idea comes in. Doug Hubbard is a famous guru on business metrics. He wrote a book called How to Measure Anything. The name of the book sounds like a stupid American self-help book, but it's actually a very, very smart book. And in the book, he has a couple of really profound ideas. One thing he talks about a lot is that people generally measure what's easy to measure, not what's important. And kind of this whole build, build, measure, learn thing, the way I've seen people implement that quite a lot is measure what's easy to measure. With kind of user stories, I, I kind of think we're also fallen into that problem without knowing it. And that's why kind of today I want to attack one of the sacred cows of Agile, that's kind of the Conextra user story format. And I want to tell you about kind of my light bulb moment that happened about three years ago where I've realized that if we just slightly modify this, slightly, we'll be able to increase the effectiveness of this immeasurably and, and get a, a lot more value out of user stories. So user stories are generally kind of uh, considered the token to hold the conversation. They are there as a um, promise that we will talk about these requirements at some points, and they are a promise that kind of uh, will together with the product owners decide what we need to build. But the, the, the real thing here is that the, the format of the story itself is um, giving us a structure for discovering metrics on success that typically are mostly technical. They are either something like this, which is kind of, um, after we do a user story, we can test it, we can see if it has any bugs, and put that into Jira where it will be forgotten for kind of history. And uh, because that's what people do with bugs, they log them. And kind of what I really like about this screenshot is, you know, there's a critical bug that's been critical for four weeks and five days, which puts a completely different perspective on the, on, on the meaning of word critical for me. Um, and kind of, the, 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 we, we try and kind of augment this with some other metrics that are kind of technical metrics like this, where kind of we do unit test coverage, and they're all incredibly precise. We know that this thing here is covered 33.33% or 69.23% and things like that. And because this is too much information, what we tend to do is we tend to kind of bundle all that and create nice moving dashboards like this one where there are some pie charts that kind of move around and we, 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 the technology is advanced so much these days that there's a tool that can estimate that this team has $335,000, $188 of technical debt that's going to be fixed if only they decided to invest 670 man days. Incredibly precise information. And at the same time, kind of incredibly useless because people keep this, it moves and nobody ever does anything about that. Again, Doug Hubbard talks about, you know, the value of a piece of information is generally proportional to the value of the decision it informs. Where kind of for this stuff and this stuff and this stuff, kind of the information, it in, the, the decision it informs is kind of, I'm going to stop watching this and watch some telly now. So, um, and, and kind of, th th there we have, you know, a, a classic problem with metrics in software. And, and this is not just a software problem. This is a problem that's plagued other industries and kind of the whole build, measure, learn idea is not a software idea. It's been around for a long time in other industries as well. One famous example of that is the Ducati racing team at MotoGP. So Ducati was a new entrant into the MotoGP, that's kind of Formula One for motors market, um, in 2003. And because they were a completely team there, they had no previous experience with doing motors for that kind of races, and they said, we just This died now. Yeah. So you have problems with cabling here generally. So, <clears throat> um, so what, what I said is we're not really going to assume anything. We're not going to for winning. We're not going to kind of try and do anything overly ambitious. What, we're just going to approach the first season as a learning experiment. And what they did is they started thinking about what they want to learn. What kind of information about 
the motor they need to be able to be better next season. And then they started building lots and lots of sensors and putting that into the motor so they could track performance. And they started, like any UB starts, they started not doing that well. They started doing regular debriefings with the drivers so they could figure out what worked well, what didn't work well, they could figure what to improve and things like that. And somewhere halfway through the 2003 season, they started winning. They started placing in the first three places consistently because they were improving their motor ev after every race. They were, imp you know, they were measuring stuff that made sense to measure, and they ended up number two overall that first season. And what they did then is so classic for software teams. What they did then is said, well, we didn't really plan to do anything that good. We ended up number two. Next year we're going to win. And they had this classic second system syndrome. Second system syndrome is a well-known kind of problem with object-oriented design and new frameworks, where people, the first time they use a new framework, they're very, very careful how they do that, and they try not to do too much. And by being very careful, they kind of get somewhere, and then the second system is where it all fails. Because they're, too over, they're overconfident and overcomplicate things, and all of a sudden you have an n-hibernate kind of script that reads using Spring that does 40 megabytes of Java to just convert two data columns into one another. And, and that's what these guys did. These guys said basically, well, we're number two without even trying. Next year we're going to win. And they stopped looking at the metrics. And they were so overconfident that the 2004 bike had about 60% new components without any kind of validation at all. And they didn't even try and change it a lot through the second season and basically ended up much, much worse than they expected. Which prompted a whole kind of discussion what they did right, what they did wrong at the end of the season, unfortunately. And then they kind of figured out they need to go back to measuring stuff. One of the key people on the team said that kind of previously what they thought is that you use metrics to figure out what to do when something's going wrong. You don't really use them when something's going right to figure out what to do better. And I think that's what we do in software. We, kind of, we use these metrics to figure out technical debt, how much money this is going to cost to fix, that we have 10,078 critical violations here, and that you know this has been critical for, I don't know, four weeks. We use negative metrics. Negative metrics are metrics that can tell us that something is wrong, but they're really bad at telling us that something's right. Um, bugs, number of bugs, bug trends, they're really good indicators that something is wrong. If I have 500 bugs in my system, if I've had a critical bug for four weeks, I know that something's wrong. But zero bugs isn't an indicator of anything. A negative metric can't give you anything positive. So zero bugs doesn't mean anything. It might mean the system wasn't tested at all. It might mean that the wrong people tested the system. It might mean that all the tests are returning true. It might mean lots of other things. So a negative indicator like the number of bugs is really good at telling us something's wrong. Uh, code coverage is another classical negative metric. A very low code coverage can tell me that this part of the system is not tested. That's useful information. A very high code coverage like this one is not really telling me anything. I have no idea what the tests are doing. I can't make a decision based on that. A good analogy of that in kind of everyday life outside of IT is blood pressure. Blood pressure is a really good negative indicator of human health. Um, if I have high blood pressure, that's a very good sign that something's wrong with me. I can reduce my blood pressure to zero instantly by chopping my head off. That's not really going to improve my health. So, and generally normal blood pressure isn't an indicator of anything. If you have normal blood pressure, that doesn't mean you're healthy. 
lots of other things could be wrong with you. So, um, kind of, uh, and, and I think by optimizing negative metrics, we, we, lots of teams I've seen get into that situation where you try and kind of chop somebody's head off to improve their health by reducing blood pressure. And one thing that in particular people don't perceive as a negative metric are story points. Story points are supposed to counteract this thing. Story points are supposed to be the measurement of value for scrum teams or kind of, you know, throughput going through Kanban is similar to that. And that's kind of trying to show that we have improved, trying to show that we deliver value. Now, the problem with story points is story points are a negative metric as well. Case point, Rapid Scrum. I stole this diagram from rapidscrum.org and I think I have the right to steal it because I will criticize it, so it's kind of fair use policy on the copyright. So, um, th this is, I really love showing this diagram, you know, go to Rapid Shock PHP, show it to your manager, and tell them that this is proof with data that Scrum makes people more effective. The green bar here is how a team that kind of adopted this rapid scrum methodology improved over a couple of months. And you can see here that they became 400% hyperproductive. That's kind of what, what this thing came to. That's, scrum is big on that hyperproductivity thing. 400% hyperproductive. Now, go and talk to any manager out there and say, would you like to make your team 400% hyperproductive? I assume very few would say no. And then, kind of you tell them where this picture is actually coming from. This is MySpace in 2009. MySpace in 2009 was bigger than Facebook. MySpace today is a uniquely irrelevant product. And they're 400% hyperproductive. So, the next question is, would you still like to be like MySpace or not? And kind of the problem with, with um, user stories, user story points, the problem with kind of velocity as, as such is that it's a negative metric. It's a metric that can tell you that something is wrong, but not, it's not a metric that can tell you that something is right. Here's an example. So, um, let's say we're in Gothenburg and uh, we want to go to the fine place called Fredericksburg and Google kind of calculates that it's going to take 4 hours and 24 minutes but we know that there are roadworks in a couple of places so it might or might not, it might not take that long we don't know and kind of there's a picture of the whole thing and our expectation is that it's going to be 4 hours 37 minutes Average velocity needed to achieve that is 82 kilometers an hour. That's how much Google predicts we can do. And let's say that we start driving towards Fredericksburg, GPS and everything, you know, we go there, and the actual one is three hours, eight minutes. We've been able to avoid some roadworks. And we had velocity of 103 kilometers, we're in Fredericksburg. Um, is this success? Raise your hand if you think we've achieved something good. One, two, three, okay, so half of the room. So, um, let's say we found a shorter way, because in order to kind of achieve this velocity, it's 320 kilometers. So, we found an even shorter way to get to Fredericksburg in shorter amount of time and kind of velocity. Who thinks this is success now? Okay, kind of slightly more than previously. Who thinks this is a big problem? Why? What kind of risks? No, but let's say that we, we have delivered. We are in Fredericksburg. Yes, that's, that's our objective. We want to go in Fredericksburg. <laughs> fair, fair enough, so... I th so, wh where are we? We're in another Fredericksburg. We're in Denmark. So there's a Fredericksburg in Denmark. We're agile. We're replant. There are roadworks here. Hey, you want to go to Fredericksburg? That's fine. You know, we found a faster, better, cheaper Fredericksburg. 
probably not cheaper, but um, so the, the problem with this piece of information is you can't know based on that. You, you can't know based on velocity and story points where you're in the right Fredericksburg or whether you're actually now 600 kilometers away from where you want to be. And th that's the real danger because kind of the user story format is not telling us where we want to be. And because it's not telling us where we want to be, it's not giving us any of those useful metrics kind of like the Ducati had in the first season. And we, we talk about iterations, we talk about kind of iterations in lots of different concepts now in, in uh, Agile and Lean. With, there's, there's 20 different ways people explain iterations now as flow, as build, measure, learn, as kind of lots of different stuff. And all of that talks about how failing fast is a good thing to do. And I think, you know, that there's, there's this fetish with failure, an obsession with failure. Kind of failing fast is good, failing fast is good. Failing fast is perfectly useless if you end up 600 kilometers where you want to be. There's no point in doing that. And kind of the, 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 again, this is something that is not software specific. This is something that other industries have had for a long time. Some of them have solved the problem. And failing fast is not something unique for software. There was this famous story of Utaka Tanayama. Utaka Tanayama is a Japanese mathematician who finally solved the problem of the second Fermat's theorem. This was a mathematical problem that tortured mathematicians for hundreds and hundreds of years. Tanayama finally proved it. And he had a unique method for proving that. Um, when he died, his colleagues tried to kind of repeat the method. And there's a fantastic show on the BBC that I watched, I can send you the URL, if, if you are kind of a mathematical geek. And they, they interviewed this guy called Goro Shimura, who worked with Tanayama for years and years and years. They worked in the same office. And he talks about kind of how Tanayama did things. He said Tanayama wasn't really careful. He was pretty sloppy as a mathematician. Everybody thought he was pretty sloppy because he made mistakes all the time. But he was very quick in discovering mistakes. And he seemed to have a talent for making mistakes in, in the right direction. So by making lots of small mistakes in the right direction, he would finally end up with a good result. And when he died, his colleagues tried to kind of emulate the process. And what they discovered in, in kind of Shimura's fantastic words is that it's very difficult to make good mistakes. And that's what kind of, if we talk about failing fast, we need to be thinking, are we kind of at least failing in the right direction? Or are we going to end up in Denmark? And kind of, th th that, that's kind of the, the, the thing why I think the way we approach planning today, and this is kind of what most software firms call roadmaps these days. This is another slide I stole, but I think I'm right to steal it under copyright laws because I'm going to criticize it, so it's fair use policy. And to see that people thought that this is a roadmap, I even have a URL that says roadmap.pdf at the end. So this is what people call roadmaps. It's kind of what we're going to do this quarter, that quarter, that quarter, it's a bunch of features. A mobile streamlined mobile application development, PDF functionalities, enabling enterprise to integrate into social media. That's what everybody does these days. It's, it's kind of, it's a shame they don't have an iPhone app as well. So, kind of, and with kind of agile and stuff like that, people say, well, we don't do that, we do user stories and we do kind of scrum. And the way most companies tend to perceive Scrum, I'm not saying this is what it was intended to be perceived like, but that's my experience how people perceive it, is there's this backlog thing here that magically appears. Then it goes into this iteration cycle and comes out as a potentially shippable product. So from a dev perspective and testing perspective, this part here is important. From a business perspective, this thing couldn't be more irrelevant. It's kind of, they collapse that, what see is a line. It's kind of backlog on one end, sausage factory, potentially shippable product at the end. Forrester Research published this amazing research uh, last year where they talk about how companies actually adopt Agile. They've done a bit of market survey and their conclusion was that most companies adopt Agile by making all the big business decisions up front. 
Then kind of you children can go and play your scrum as much as you want. And then there's a big business validation process at the end. And they, they named the paper Water Scrum Fall, which I think perfectly illustrates what I've seen at lots of big banks. And um, there's kind of, you know, people say, well, you know, we're not no longer doing Scrum. Now Kanban is more popular. And um, th there was this joke uh, last week about Bankan. Have you heard what Bankan is? Bankan is Kanban Dimebank banks. Kind of decide the next two years of your project up front, then kind of move things around on post-its, on, on cork boards, and you know, keep it potentially shippable for a couple of months until everybody's really happy with that. So, uh, kind of the, 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 the problem with this is that people are stuck in a linear thinking model. This is the backlog we committed. This is what we're going to do. And, and the metrics are useful only for testing and kind of test coverage and stuff like this. This kind of thinking promotes negative metrics because we optimize this part of the process. And what people do with user stories is they put them into kind of Jira like this. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know how many teams I've worked with where they have 200 user stories that are approved, whatever that means. And kind of, they get ticked off linearly. As they pop off the stack, they get ticked off. They put in a potentially shippable product. It says potentially shippable indefinitely. So, kind of, this kind of thing is not iterative. This is linear. And when, I, when we talk about linear thinking, linear thinking is a problem that's been known outside software for years and years and years. What, one of the best examples that is uh, civil engineering, where um, I, I kind of and I read about this reference in Tim Hartford's book Adapt: Why Success Always Starts with Failure. He talks about adaptive planning in economy, adaptive planning in civil engineering, and things like that. Fantastic book if you want to kind of really do adaptive planning correctly, not kind of the software way, but correctly. And he talks about this guy who invented the Lean Startup about a hundred years ago. His name was Peter Palczynski, and Palczynski was a Russian civil engineer during the Imperial Russian era, and he realized that kind of most big civil engineering projects there fail because of linear thinking. One particular project he complained about quite a lot during the Soviet era, after, after the uh, uh, empire fell, was this White Sea Canal thing, which I think is, is an amazing, amazing piece of history that both succeeded and failed at the same time. White Sea Canal was this thing where somebody came up with an idea that if you look at kind of Leningrad or, you know, Petersburg now, there's lots of lakes above that until the Northern Sea. And there's only about 200 kilometers of land. Everything else is lakes. And they thought, well, it's kind of very difficult to move Navy and kind of ships around because, you know, there's Sweden over there, their enemies and things like that. So why don't we just dig a canal from the Baltic Sea to the Northern Sea and then we'll be able, you know, to send lots of military and send lots of trade ships and stuff like that very easily without having to argue with Sweden. And um, what they did is basically plotted the line there and Polchinski said that's never going to work. And it's never going to work because there are three dimensions that are impossible to plan for. And those three dimensions are, I think, hurting us in software all the time as well. So he said the first dimension that's impossible to plan for is a local dimension. Because you have no idea how things are going to turn out when you start digging. And in software, this would translate to context. Kind of, does this stuff work with Oracle? Does this stuff work on a 3G network? Does this stuff work for people in Finland if we want to go roll up? them. Um, and kind of the second dimension that's very difficult to plan for, it's completely unpredictable, is a time-based dimension. As you start doing stuff, things will. And the third dimension, he said, was incredibly important and unpredictable is the human dimension, where you, know, you can try and do as much as you want with planning. You can try and kind of cause changes, but it's really up to the people to decide if they want to do something or not do something. And kind of in, translated to software, that means, you know, fair enough, you can put your brilliant new iPhone up on the App Store, 
but you can't influence people to really start kind of you can't make people download it you can only kind of start influencing them they might download it they might not download it there are things beyond your control and the white sea canal is famous for actually succeeding in terms of they dug the canal exactly where they wanted to dig it and it's famous for failing because of those three dimensions for example the time-based dimension that nobody considered that area of russia is frozen for six months a year so they have a canal where the water frozen for six months a year not particularly useful it failed because of a local dimension in certain places where they dug because they already decided where they're going to dig and that wasn't movable certain places where they dug they hit the rock so hard that they could only dig about two meters of it so they could say okay we finished here let's move on so the canal is frozen for six months a year and even though six months when it's not frozen there are parts of it where only very small boats can go through so pretty much you know the whole idea of they're going to ship military left right and center is not going to work at all and Alchinsky kind of um, identified three principles that can help people create plans that avoid those problems he said it's impossible absolutely impossible to predict what's going to happen in those dimensions but what we can do is we can create plans that help us react to those problems when they occur and not just react to those problems that allow us to exploit opportunities when they occur for example to a local dimension they might have realized that digging through one part of the kind of um, uh, uh, land there is much easier than the others so they could have kind of moved things through that so Palczynski identified three principles and you'll see why I think he invented build measure learn a hundred years ago he said the first principle kind of don't really set on what you're going to do up front but kind of because we know that they're going to be unpredictable things <clears throat> try lots of new ideas and try lots of new things and some of them will work some of them will fail then the thing we need to do is kind of the second principle is try those things so that any of those things failing is not going to kill you this is where user stories are brilliant this is where user stories can do their best for us user stories are small chunks of work that can succeed or fail and if they fail it's not such a big problem and the last thing that Palczynski identified is kind of selection because we're trying lots of these different things figure out what worked what didn't work and improve based on that so and of this has been now rediscovered as build measure learn it's been rediscovered by the design thinking community as there are two different models of thinking design thinking is an approach to running businesses that was invented by ideo the famous design agency and they talk about how <coughs> effectively analysis is pointless if you only have one option because you've already chosen it and the kind of the strength of analysis is really helping people select between different options so their product design process has two different mental states it actually has four but kind of these are the two that are important for this discussion and a mental state that's kind of divergent where it's about creating lots of options and then there's analysis in the middle then convert way of thinking that kind of selects between those options and kind of this is where I think we are really 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 bad in software because the way we plan the way we organize analysis the way we do our product designs is like this and we claim that this is a roadmap but this is not actually a roadmap this is a roadmap it's a map with roads if you go and talk to anybody who's not in IT and tell them a roadmap, they will think about this. In IT, a roadmap is this. And kind of this is not a roadmap because there are no roads here. There's only one way through. So there's only one road, and even that one road is going through a tunnel. You come in on one end, you come out on the other end, and then you figure out that you're in Denmark. So kind of in order to really get the value out of iterative delivery in order to get the value out of user stories 
kind of, and this is what again forest research talks about in their water scrum fall paper. Organizations are not really getting value out of water scrum fall. There's, there's a slight improvement in development and stuff like that. There's some improvement, but they're not really getting the big promise of iterative delivery. Because the big promise of iterative delivery is, hey, I want to go there, I'm on this side, I start doing this, this bridge is blocked. Fair enough, I'll just go through another bridge. That's okay. And we're not doing our plans like this. We have to start doing plans more like this. Plans full of options. Plans kind of that are detailed in the next couple of steps where we want to go to and have a broader picture that tells us where we want to go. If I want to go to Friedrichsberg, I don't need to go all exact streets immediately. I need to know the general direction, the first couple of roads I'm going to take and kind of where I want to go. And if you want to create plans like this, we have to steal one more idea from somebody else. And this is how to navigate this mess. Because once we have lots and lots of options, it becomes a mess to navigate. Fifteen years ago, kind of, you know, when, when we start driving with plan all journey up front, and then there's a person that's reading a map and saying, no, left, no, 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 not that left, the other left, no, no, oh, you missed it! Then you stop, you go out, you argue for a while, and then kind of you start figuring out where you are. You ask the nice lady that doesn't speak any English where you are to point on the map, and then kind of figure out where to go where you want to be. And now no longer, nobody does that anymore. What we have is we have this. When you go off the road, this magically replants stuff. There's no more arguments who's not how to drive, or who, who, do you know, where's left, where's not left. We have GPS, where kind of effectively, it's not a, such a big problem if you take the wrong street. It's not such a big problem if a, if a bridge is blocked. This is going to magically recalculate it for you very, very quickly. And this is where we can get kind of the promise of Agile working for us. This is where we can get the promise of kind of higher throughput through iterative delivery working for us. If we could come up with something like this, then we could feed it with lots of options. And once we feed it with lots of options, if we go off track, it will magically recalculate things for us. And kind of, I don't have the perfect solution for everybody. I can tell you what we started doing and how we started solving it. Maybe it's going to work for you, maybe not. But if it doesn't, try and come up with what this would mean for you. And kind of the things we discovered we were lacking are these two things here. We had this stuff. We had user stories and velocity. That's good. But velocity is only good as a negative metric. If your velocity is very low, if your car is moving at 10 kilometers an hour, you know something's wrong. You don't need to know what is wrong. You know, you know immediately you need to start fixing stuff. Maybe the bridge is blocked. Maybe the road is congested. The, the engine's broken. There's lots of different things that could be wrong. But once the car is moving 90 kilometers an hour, 80 kilometers an hour, that stops becoming that useful as a piece of information. It's still a good control thing to see that it's not dropping to 10, but it's no longer that useful as a piece of information. Like user stories, velocity and stuff like that. If you are releasing one user story a week, that's kind of telling you have user stories that are too big, it's not that good, it's... But once you start releasing smaller user stories, once they go through the pipeline quickly, that stops being a useful metric. And kind of, we lacked these things and we started thinking, well, what we need to do is we need to figure out what does our next turn look like? And how do we know that we have taken the next turn? And this is where user stories are really good. User stories are basically the next turn in the map full of options. And we need to figure out, have we taken the next turn? And then if we did that, we would be able to come up with this thing as well. Now, the problem with that is kind of in this Palczynski principle where we need to seek out feedback, because the way we are seeking out feedback from user stories is the stuff I've shown earlier. We are seeking feedback using negative metrics. We need to start seeking feedback using some much more positive metrics. And the problem again is the way we structure user stories like this. Because there is no positive success criteria for this. 
people say, well, you know, this part here is what the business really wants. So we kind of can focus talking about that part, but the problem with that part is there's no measurement of success. There's nothing to tell you, have you made your next turn or not. This is what the next turn might look like, but I can't tell you whether you've achieved it or not. Because before this user story was done, this person was able to monitor the inventory. He could go into the warehouse and look at the boxes. He could look at the books. He could look at the legacy system. If all else fails, he could look at SAP. I don't know. Kind of, but the... Before this user story was done, this person was able to monitor inventory. After this user story is done, this person will still be able to monitor inventory. And there's no success criteria there. The question is not whether they will be able to monitor the inventory or not. The question is how differently will they be able to monitor the inventory after that. And this is again another idea that we can steal from somebody else. Robert Brinkerhoff wrote this book called Systems Thinking in Human Resource Development, which is kind of the most boring title for a book ever. And, but the book is actually quite smart. And he wrote that in, in 1991. Uh, he was an HR manager at a large American corporation where they spent millions and millions on training every year. And this was his budget and he thought, well, we measure this kind of training and we look at the stuff and you know we, we, we try and do a lot of this but if we were really successful with that by now we should have been making a lot more money and we're not things are improving slowly but they're not really there's no big movement anywhere so he started looking at how they measure what are the metrics how they measure success for these things and they said well you know what we do to measure training is have a bunch of tick boxes have you enjoyed the training of course, I've been kind of two days off work. Did you learn everything you expected? Well, probably. I mean, if I say no, they're probably not going to send me on any training or I'm stupid for not learning or things like that. You know, was the speaker knowledgeable about the talk? Well, you know, he has a mustache and everything, probably his. So, um, th there's no kind of overall success criteria and Brinkerhoff's light bulb moment was in the same thing kind of as, as uh, we were discussing earlier where, where um, he realized they focus training on the type of work people want to do it wasn't a dev shop but if it were a dev shop what that means is that well they'd send java developers to java advanced java training they would send testers to istqb they would send kind of they would do that and he said well that's kind of problematic because people could test before people can test after we're not really making the change and his light bulb moment was to think about well what is the change in the type of work somebody wants to do. He calls that an impact. He says, well, that impact is how we decide whether we have taken the next turn or not. And kind of translated to user stories, how differently will this person be able to monitor the inventory? This is what I started looking at. Whenever I get a user story like this, does this part show a change or not? And if it doesn't show a change, the first question is how differently? For example, faster. Now we open up a discussion how much faster is faster. And we can now start looking at, okay, I have 20 user stories about this thing, but all you want is 10% faster. Maybe if the first user story brings us to 10%, we don't have to do the other nine. Or maybe, you know, we do the first three user stories, if they don't pe make people monitor the inventory faster, is it really justified to keep the code and the tests there? Or do we throw out those user stories? Kind of one, one of the weirdest things I've uh, heard when I spoke to people for the Spec by Example book is uh, at, at USWitch they had this weird process I completely m did not get when I spoke to them. It took me six months to understand what they were talking about. And they said, well, with every change they have, with every backlog item, they ask business people to give them KPI movements. So this user story is going to cause these things in our five key performance indicators. And what they would do is they would 
very quickly do a slice of that, roll it out to 10% of their servers and measure the change compared to the other stuff. And if the change happened in both places, that meant it wasn't due to this user story. It was due to some other time factor or local factor people didn't understand. If the change happened all in the part where they had their new user story, that means they did something good, assuming the change went in the right direction. If the change went in the opposite direction, they would drop the code and drop the test. Regardless of all the technical tests passing, code coverage being well and stuff like that, that idea failed. It was the wrong turn to take. And kind of that allowed them to keep the system nice and small without overcomplicating with all the features ever. Because kind of in software we very, very rarely take features out. Software systems are typically where features go to die. That's kind of you just accumulate, accumulate, accumulate. It never gets removed because there's no good process to decide whether this was a good feature or not. We put stuff into our plans just because Mike from the second floor in marketing wanted that. Nobody ever asks was that a good decision or not, where if you start thinking about, well, in order to do this faster, now we can measure are people doing it faster or not. And we can put testing kind of much more to a business perspective and we can start deciding are we taking the next turn or have we failed to take the next turn at all. And this is what Anthony Ulrich also writes about in his fantastic book on what customers want. Ulrich was the program manager for PC Junior at IBM. And PC Junior is a fantastic project. Does, any, does anybody remember PC Junior? Has, uh, did anybody buy a PC Junior? No, that's very typical because they wrote off about $2 billion on this failed project because nobody bought it. And funny thing about that is they did everything the customers told them to do. They did lots of very kind of detailed focus groups, user research case studies and everything, everything, everything. And then they built this computer that was supposed to be the home computer that nobody wanted to buy. And Anthony Ulrich wrote a book called What Customers Want as kind of his I guess, penance for spending $2 billion on a failed project. And in that, he has a couple of really interesting learnings. One of the biggest learnings he has is that kind of good products do not come from implementing everything people tell you they want. Good products come from figuring out what people actually want to do and then figuring out how to do some kind of a positive change there. So, you know, figuring out how to change somebody's way of working. And this is, again, this part of a user story has to be about a change, not about a behavior. We kind of, especially behavior-driven development, kind of propagated this idea of behavior and people put behaviors there. That's, if you only have a behavior there, there's no success criteria on it. If you have a behavior change, then we can talk about how much we need to change. And we can talk about, is this the right behavior change to make? Do we really want to get people to do this faster? Why is that important? And this is kind of the other Brinkhoff idea comes in where he says, well, once you start figuring out the impacts, then the question of what do these impacts potentially contribute to becomes much easier. And you start connecting this thing to some wider business goals. So what I started doing is basically giving people cards like this. Instead of give me scope as feature, give me scope as this. Somebody can help you achieve a business goal by doing something better, faster, sooner, or somebody can obstruct you from achieving a business goal by doing something slower or worse or something. What's the change that you want to allow? What's the change you want to prevent? And this becomes a roadmap. This becomes a set of options that we could play with figure out, well, we might cause this, we might cause that, we might cause this as well. And then the question is, how much is enough? So um, what, what this kind of tends to result in is a hierarchy from business goals to impacts to kind of deliverables that start becoming a really, really nice roadmap. So this is an example from, a simplified example from a project where um, we, we worked on this. We started with the idea that kind of uh, the owner of the company came in and said, the next thing we want you to do is do levels and achievements for all the games. And he said, hey, that's a nice tunnel of about seven months of work. Are you sure you want to do that? He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. We talked to the marketing guys. They, you know, 
here are wireframe diagrams, here's everything, everything is approved, go and do it. And he said, like, that's a tunnel, a nine, you know, nine, seven to nine month tunnel. Let's try and understand what impacts you want to cause. And he said, well, what do you mean? Well, imagine that we do levels and achievements and nothing changes in the way people interact to the system. That's probably a waste of time and money. Yeah? So, what are you expecting to change? And he said, well, um, once we have levels and achievements, people will post more to Facebook. He said, okay, that's good, that's a good change. So, why is that change important? He said, well, it's important because we want it. No, but, you know, let's put some destination there. Let's make sure we're not going to Denmark, we're going to the right, kind of Friedrichsberg. So, he um, said, so, well, if people post more about this, then other people will come and play the games. He said, okay, that's other kind of behavior. Where is the bigger picture? They said, well, more players, more money. He said, okay, how much more is more? If we spend nine months doing this, and we give you five more players, is that good? It's silly. She said, okay, how much more is more? He said, well, if we don't get at least one more million players out, we've wasted time and money. Good. So we know that kind of the destination on the map, the place where we want to go to is one more million players. And one option is to get those levels and achievements and make people post more. And now what we can do is we can see, does this road actually exist? Is it under roadworks? Is it congested? Is it blown up? Or is it a motorway where we can drive a truck through? And can we said, okay, that's too big, but if this is what you want to kind of prove, um, we already have tournaments, so maybe we can just do a pop-up after a tournament is won. Say, hey, you won a tournament, would you like to post to Facebook? It's not going to be perfect, it's not going to give you one more million players, but it will prove or disprove this whole idea. And we said, okay, let's do that. It took us a couple of hours to do that. And we have proved to everybody's surprise that people don't like to spam their friends. And we said, here's the data. I mean, did you really want to spend kind of seven months doing this? It doesn't look that promising. And we said, okay, let's, let's try another idea. You know, let's come up with more options. We've done the analysis, discarded an option. Let's come up with more options. And we said, well, another way of kind of influencing people, another impact we can is invite more friends. We start growing them up, explore different roads. And we said, well, immediately the, the, you know, the marketing guy said, okay, so what we can do is we can offer people free chips. I can give you some screenshots. We can integrate it with this. We can integrate it with that. We have this marketing. He said, stop, 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 stop. We don't need to know that many details now. All we need to do now are the next couple of steps we need to take. So let's first prove that this road exists. And we said, maybe we don't automate the whole thing completely now, ever, and kind of let's do something that just allows us to learn that this thing is okay. And we said, what if we put a button there where people can click on this button and we just put their emails into a text file We'll manually give them chips. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll do that manually every hour. And we'll just tell people your chips will be credited in an hour. And, you know, or next working day. And we'll stay overnight and send these emails. And that's what we did. We tried to prove this thing. And then we proved that, yes, give people the possibility to send invites. They will do that. But no, more players are not coming. So we have a block it there. And we said this that didn't seem to work. It was a bit better than last time, but it didn't seem to work. And then the marketing guy said, no, no, this is the best possible idea. What do you mean? It's a proven idea. It's, it. He said, look, you don't have to be right. Just give us an assumption why you felt this failed. Just give us an assumption. That's OK. And he said, well, my assumption is that the link in the email was in the text. You couldn't see it's a link very easily. Maybe people just read the email and didn't click on the link. He said, OK. The way we test that assumption is put a big button that says, join game now in the email. And we sent a couple of hundred emails manually, and we proved that, hey, this road is actually a motorway. You can go really fast there, and the police are not going to stop you. And we then started automating stuff, and by the time we ticked off a couple of items there, we were pretty much on track to do this, and we said, okay, this is good enough. We don't have to go and do levels and achievements. We don't have to do any other stuff. We have 
pretty much achieved what we want to achieve. Now we can move on to the next thing. So, kind of, we started creating a roadmap and we had a GPS that allowed us to replan quickly. And I said, might be not the perfect thing for everybody, but, you know, try and come up with something equivalent for you. So, um, so we, we had a meeting in uh, February this year with um, a couple of people who are working on similar techniques. This is mapping out those impacts is one technique. It's not the only one. It's not the best one. There's lots of alternatives as well. And this is just kind of, if it doesn't work for you, investigate other stuff. But we, we try to identify what's common for all those practices. What, what is the purpose of this whole thing? What does it allow people to do? And we identified kind of four principles that allow people to do. And I think if you kind of start slightly shifting your organizational mindset towards these things, regardless of which technique you use, you will end up creating a nice GPS for yourself. And the first thing is that kind of people should really know why they're doing the work. What is the bigger picture? Where's the destination? And that's kind of the center of the map. That's where we want to go. Communicating that to everybody is incredibly important because it helps narrow down all the other discussions. You can start thinking about, well, this user story is not really part of that business goal. It's a good user story, and thank you, Mike, for asking for it, but it's a not now. Chris Matt says, never say no to business people. They'll be offended. Tell them not now. You've chosen this business goal. This user story doesn't fit in. So, the second thing is, as organizations, we should focus a lot more on delivering impacts and outcomes rather than delivering features. We should measure success in terms of the impacts we've achieved with the software, not how many user stories we've released. Actually, features, more features is bad. That's complexity. So, the other thing is that kind of, we need to navigate this roadmap by deciding what to do next based on some immediate and direct feedback from the outcome of the work, from kind of how people are using this stuff. And the more we can do that, the better, because that will help us create a GPS that can be planned faster. So faster feedback in any kind of sense like that is good. And the third one, the, the last one we, we realized is that once you communicate this to everybody, um, it turns out that people do really start caring about what gets released. And people do really start caring about this part or that part and all the questions around prioritization, estimation, stuff like that become much, much easier to do. So kind of the, those, are, those are the things that I want to leave you with, regardless of what technique you use, regardless of what you do, if you can start moving your organizational mentality towards this, you will resolve what the scrum fall. And the organization will get a lot of lot more value out of agile, out of lean, and things like that. So, I've mentioned a couple of books. The first one is "What Customers" by Anthony Ulwick. Fantastic book. Kind of try try and read that if you have time. Uh, second one is "The Learning Alliance" and kind of the systems thinking and human resource development. Um, it's it's an incredibly thought provoking book. Incredibly dull. So, uh, it's one. Of things where, you know, it's, it's, it's better for somebody to rewrite it in a better way, uh, but, but a very, very insightful book. So um, the, the, the next one is How to Measure Anything by Doug Hubbard, um, especially when you start thinking about positive metrics, kind of business outcomes, this stuff becomes invaluable, it has lots of really good ideas how to measure business outcomes. Then Adapt by Tim Hartford, where uh, he talks about adaptive planning in economy, adaptive planning in civil engineering, adaptive planning, and lots of other industries will think, you know, really create good roadmaps. And kind of the last one I'll leave you with is, is my book on kind of this visualization I've shown you that's called Impact Mapping, where you can read about half of the book for free online on impactmapping.org. So um, th th that's pretty much it for, for what I wanted to talk about. Um, I hope I've challenged your thinking at least a bit. And um, if you remember one thing from this, try because that's going to be the gateway drug to everything else. So um, I don't know, have I overrun on time or do we have time for questions? Almost 10 minutes left for questions. So um, does, does anybody have any questions? Okay, then we have almost 10 minutes for alcohol. So. <laughs> 
Yeah. Oh, we have a question. Okay. Okay. So we don't have a co-located team. So my question is if you have any experience on doing impact mapping sessions with a team that's not co-located. Uh, yeah, I do. Um, and if you do them once per milestone to kind of set the bigger picture um, and the project is important, people will travel. If people are not going to invest one day of their time every milestone, really, really senior people, not going to invest one day of their time every milestone to travel in the same location, you're probably not doing something important. Which means stop that and do something else. Yeah, even if there's like two or three continents apart? Um, Again, that, that, that depends. You can do. Um, I, I, I made people travel all over Europe for that. I've not made them travel two or three continents apart. Um, if they are two or three continents apart, then kind of I'd probably try do this in, in every location separately and then have a merging session to do this. I don't have any experience doing that, but um, kind of we're talking about really really important strategic planning. That's kind of the direction of where you are going to go for the next three to six months. So uh, if, they, if, they, if they don't want to invest time in that, you're either talking to the wrong people or it's not that important. And which is fine, you know, sometimes people will discover this is not that important. That's okay, then don't complain how we do it, we'll just fudge it. And that's okay, everybody understands it's not that important. Or if it is, let's get together and figure out what we want to do. So, okay, so the question is, you mentioned that it's a behavior thing that you want to describe. So do you behavior change. A, yeah, the change in itself. So, so do you connect that somehow to the feature that you actually develop? Because yes, so you connect it using, using kind of a roadmap like this. So the behavior change is inviting more friends. The feature is semi-automated invites. So it's yeah. visually connected. And the nice thing about this is it prevents uh, pet feature user stories from coming in. User stories typically have, as a user, in order to do something, I want this. As a player, in order to invite more friends, I want semi-automated invites. As a trader, in order to trade, I want to trade, is impossible to fit in. As a system, I want this report impossible to fit in. So these are the features you're going to develop. This could break down, this is a simplistic version, this could break down much more into kind of smaller user stories and things like that. But kind of, it shows you the thinking process. It shows how things are connected visually. So you can actually see why doing this and what's the success criteria for that. So one more question. Uh, you mentioned Jira earlier. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any experience in mapping this Within the era, like if you, Jira is if you a wonderful do, yeah. tool for doing the wrong thing right. There. Yeah, that's what I'm saying because Jira lends itself to a particular process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, and I love the fact that Jira calls things issues because once you have things in Jira, you really have an issue. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, kind of Jira is Jira is so joking aside. Jira is a perfectly useful tool for task management. Once you know what tasks you want to do, you can start mapping those, you know, 10 tasks that connect to this into Jira. There's a tool called Speclog. Speclog allows people to have a visual representation like this and then exports to Jira or connects to Jira, if, if I understand correctly, and mm -hmm. other task planning tools. So um, people tend to do that. I, I, since I started doing this, all we have is a map. And kind of tasks are assigned based on kind of I give you this, you take that. And we, 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 we kind of don't necessarily need to track things that much because my team is really flexible. Um, if you need to have more traceability or things like Speclog might help or, you know, once you decide this is what you want to do, create 10 tasks for that, put it into Jira. I, I don't know, have I, have I answered your question or have I just confused you more? No, 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 definitely. Uh, it, but it's... Um it would be interesting to see if there's any kind of system that you can actually lay out these uh, high-level goals. And so Speclog, Speclog can. Yeah. There's another one called Effect Cup. Uh, that's a web tool that can do that as well. I, I don't know if it connects to Jira or not. But Speclog is a really nice thing to look at. 
Okay, Now let's take a break then. Thank you very much. I'm going to skip the microphone because I think I'm loud enough for everyone to hear me. <laughs>